Hello everyone. Okay, so I have hidden from my children in our boat. It's in the backyard. It is not in the water, but, and it's not very pretty. It is a fishing boat, an aluminum fishing boat. And, um, ah! and I'm going to read from in here because no kids will distract me. Okay, so we are reading chapter 13. And chapter 13 is told from Mr. St. Clair's point of view. Uh, we had just heard Mr. St. Clair kind of talking with his friend online, or sorry, on the phone, about how he really felt about Arlene, and his friend suggested making an honest woman out of Arlene. Anyways, let's find out what happens. When he finally found it, the ring, he knew it was the right ring. <laughs> I totally think we made the right prediction. Okay, I think that he's gonna propose. He saw he would have to drain all, oh sorry. So, he found it and he knew it was the right ring right away. He saw that he would have to all but drain his savings, which he hated to do, which means it's really expensive, okay? It made him feel good just knowing it was there but he knew it wouldn't be there for long. The ring wasn't big enough to be flashy, but it was big enough, set in white gold with smaller diamonds halfway around the band, a little old-fashioned, but he liked that about it. A little like his mother's, but not enough to be significant. It was just the right one because he knew it was. He left the ring sitting in the store, went home, and obsessed about it. Decided to sleep on it, but he didn't sleep well. In the morning, he went by the jewelers again, afraid that it would be gone. When it wasn't, he put it on layaway, knowing he could change his mind. So layaway is when you're buying something expensive in a store, or even inexpensive, that you come up with like a payment plan. Um, they hold on to it. They don't let any other customers pay for it, and then you just slowly pay for it. And then when you've paid everything, then you get it. So he's put it on layaway. But at his next breakfast table encounter with Trevor, he knew he had to do it. He looked at Trevor and knew he couldn't buy a cheaper ring or cheapen their relationship by buying none at all. To do right by Arlene was to do right by Trevor. And of course, himself. He had it in his pocket the next time when he took her out for dinner. She wore a rose-colored silk blouse and smiled openly, looking for all the world like someone he'd always known and always wanted to marry, with no doubts in between. He stuck his hand in his jacket pocket and grasped the little velvet-covered box. He was sure. He almost brought it out, but he missed the moment. But he would. It was only a matter of time. He was sure. And she might not be. Oh no, one of my children found me. <laughs> That's okay, I just told them to go eat a snack. Anyways, so now he's kind of worried that will Arlene say yes? He's sure he wants to marry her, but is she sure that he wants to, that she wants to marry him? Okay, he'd been so busy with his own doubts, he'd forgotten to consider the very real possibility that she might say no. He took his hand back from his pocket and tried to forget the box was there. When he walked her to the door later that evening, they both claimed exhaustion. Reuben gave her a small kiss. The moment made him nervous and reminded him of the moment she'd come into his home unexpectedly, right around the time he'd expected the kiss off. I don't like reading about kisses. He'd loved her for that. Even as he ran away, everything else had been a game to avoid this very moment. When he knew that life with her was what he wanted, he knew also that something was wrong. You okay? She said. Her voice sounded faint, scared. Or he was scared enough himself to hear it that way. Sure, why wouldn't I be? I don't know. He just seemed kind of funny tonight. Just tired. Yeah, me too. He called himself a coward on the way to the car. Halfway home, it hit him, like waking from a dream. 
He could not imagine what he had been thinking or why. He could not believe he'd almost said it out loud. He thought about Arlene, tried to bring her picture to mind, but she looked like a stranger. When he got home, he found the receipt for the ring in his drawer, right where he'd left it. Does that mean he might return it and is not going to propose? Miss Liza, that's his cat, jumped on the bed with him and rubbed against his chin. He told her everything, described the cliff, which he'd almost jumped, which means he almost proposed to her and you're jumping off a cliff into marriage. Anyways, she agreed that humans were impulsive and strange at best. He told her he'd return the ring in the morning, but he never quite got around to that. We're gonna read chapter 14 too, okay? So he never got around to returning the ring. I wonder what that means. That's a good place to make a prediction. Anyways, chapter 14 is Matt. Remember, he's the grocery store guy. He got money from Mrs. Greenberg. He spent it wisely. He didn't buy the fancy motorcycle. And he was looking at classes to enroll in. Matt was riding by an alley in Astorado on his new motorcycle when he saw it. A man was sitting in the dark concrete in the alley, his back half up against a building, one arm wrapped around his own ribs as if in pain. Then the this, this scene disappeared as the bike sped on. Matt looked in his rear view mirror and made a careful U-turn, drove back down the alley, turned in and idled the bike down to a stop for a few feet away from the man's sprawled leg. He was young, maybe only a couple years older than Matt, and his face was bleeding. He looked up to Matt, eyes stony, but maybe with some fear hidden underneath. Matt didn't know who the guy might have expected to see, but it was clear by his face that Matt wasn't it. The eyes softened again. You okay, Matt? Depends on your definition of okay. You've been better. You need to get to a hospital? No, he said, no hospital, but I need to get somewhere that isn't here. Hmm. So my spidey senses are telling me that maybe he was doing something he's not supposed to do. If he doesn't want to go to the hospital to get help, maybe he's trying to avoid the police or maybe trying to avoid somebody else um, and that he needs to leave the area. So I wonder what this guy has gotten himself into. Matt woke at six the following morning, and the guy was still asleep on his couch. Ooh, that means Matt brought him home. He made a pot of coffee. He didn't have to work that day, which was good, because he didn't know this guy well enough to leave him alone in his apartment. When the coffee began to drip, the smell seemed to bring his guest around. Good morning, Matt said. I forgot what you said your name was. Sydney G. Right. I tried about 10 times to talk you into going to the hospital last night, but you wouldn't budge. Seems strange, but I figured you were delirious. But now that it's morning and you've had some sleep and it's pretty obvious that your arm is broken, he pointed to Sydney's right forearm, swollen to more than twice its normal size. So you know you need an emergency room, right? Sydney G sat up defensively, Matt thought. No, no, no hospital man. Just a cup of coffee and I'll be on my way. Don't you want to even report what happened? Report? Yeah, report. As in to the police? Matt watched the word register in Sydney's eyes. That's when he knew something was wrong. Our spidey senses were correct. Nothing to report, he said, as if the whole thing meant nothing to him. But that made no sense. Then his eyes burned into Matt's. Hey, why'd you stop to help me anyway? You don't know me. I was paying it forward. This lady who used to come to my store and left me some money in her will, she said I should pay the, for pay the favor forward to three people. And then what? And then they do the same. But what Matt was increasingly sorry he'd ever brought it up because now he had doubts about this man he'd tried to help and he wanted to take back what he'd said about Mrs. Greenberg's idea. He didn't want this guy's fingerprints on it. You did something illegal, didn't you? No. Why would you say that? 
because you don't want a broken arm set and you don't want to tell the police anything about who broke it? Nah, nothing like that, man. I'll just get going. Sidney G. rose unsteadily to his feet, then wobbled as if he might pass out. He blinked, steadied, steadied himself, and then headed for the door. Don't worry. I'll do that forward thing. No, Matt said. Don't. His voice sounded cold and flat, even to him. Excuse me? Don't pay it forward. Why not? Because I think you did something illegal, and I think you're not who I thought you were, and I don't want you to be one of the three people I help anymore, and I don't want this idea in your hands. Sidney G moved close until his nose was just a few inches from Matt's. Matt felt a cold clamp of fear in his gut, but he stood his ground. Well, well, Sidney G said, that's not very nice. You're welcome for bailing you out. Whatever, man. Sidney shook his head, broke away, and headed for the door. Matt breathed a sigh of relief. Wait, he said. Sidney stopped. Wait a minute. He walked into the kitchen and poured a cup of coffee into the mug that he liked the least, the one with the chip in the base. He looked up to see Sidney watching him curiously. Keep the mug, he said, carrying it to the door and handing it off. Another strange moment of silence. Sidney studied his face for clues, but don't pay it forward. Right, Matt said. I'll just find somebody else. Please don't. As soon as the door closed, Matt called the Astorado police to tell them what he knew. They thanked him for calling, but told him the circumstances didn't match up with any crime that they knew of. From the diary of Trevor. Okay, so again, we're hearing from Trevor, and it's from the diary of Trevor. We're not having like his own Trevor chapter. Okay. I have no idea what happened between Reuben and Mom. Must have been really weird though, because now every time I see Reuben, he says, So, Trevor, how's your mom? And then he says, So, does she ever ask about me? Ask what? I'm always thinking but it's usually better not to mix into these things. Then I'll get home and mom says, ever see Reuben? And I say, yeah, I see him all the time. And she says, so does he ever talk about me? Sometimes I just want to yell at them both. I want to say, just talk to each other. It's not that hard. I mean, this is not brain surgery, guys. But grownups hate it when you talk to them like that. So I have this system. I never tell either of them what they really want to know. Then, sooner or later, they're going to have to break down and talk to each other. Sometimes, I worry that this will all be weird about... I'm oh, sorry. Sometimes, I worry that I'll be this weird about a girl when I grow up. I hate to think that. Okay. So, um, I don't know what's going on with Ruben and his Arlene either. He was going to propose, then he decided he wasn't going to propose, and now they're kind of trying to talk between to Trevor, like, well, what is she saying? Well, what is he saying? So I wonder if they have ended their relationship. Anyways, this was a nice quiet spot to film, and I'm thinking in the back of my mind I should find more hiding spots from my kids to make these videos for you. Anyways, miss you all lots, and see you later. Bye!